we have that I was recently in introduced to uh, through another individual, Dr. Pelsman, and his name is Richard Carlton. And we had a conversation that was so stimulating for only about 30 minutes when I first met him because of the excitement. And I don't do that very often, but Dr. Richard Carlton, if you could share some of your uh, observations and deeply welcome you to the call. Okay. M Michael? We can hear you now. Okay. So um, my colleague, Dr. Michael Peltzman, was talking to me about a patient that we share in common. And then at the end of the conversation about the patient, he says, they want to tell me about this Avison device. And if I'm not interested, it's perfectly okay but he thought I might like to hear about it. So he told me about it. What he told me was that his very severe neurological disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which had paralyzed him, is slowly coming out of paralysis. It was leaving him with residual pain, very severe, eight out of 10, which is excruciating pain. He's a very brave man. Um, as soon as uh, Michael left, got Michael Pelsman set up with an Avison machine, the pain went down to four. That caught my attention. Um, I prescribe medical cannabis for people. I'm, I'm pretty, as a psychiatrist, I'm pretty good at helping people with pain. But I've never seen anything like this. <clears throat> so I looked into it, and, and I had the great pleasure of having a, a video conference with Dr. Joey Bird and some other people here. And um, I told them what I was thinking was going on. I'm going to share with you what I was thinking was going on. And I'm going to tell you what happened to Joe Bird. So first, here's what I think is going on. You know that you're warming the palm with this machine and that the palm has a special circulation. So there's no capillaries between the artery and the vein. It's a direct shunt and anastomosis that can really warm up the blood. <clears throat> When you warm the blood, hemoglobin, hemoglobin that's in the red blood cells will give up its oxygen much more readily to the tissues. Um, there's something called a hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, and it's shaped from where you're sitting it's like an S curve, sigmoid. And the whole curve gets shifted to the right under heat. That's important for muscles. <clears throat> because when the blood is going through the muscles and the muscles are warming up, you want more oxygen delivered, right? So hemoglobin is well designed to cough up its oxygen when it's warm and to keep it more avid when it's cold, like going through the lungs, and you want to absorb the oxygen into the blood and then cough it up in the muscles when they're warmed up. So this device, by raising the temperature of the blood circulating to the body, is going to release much more oxygen. That in itself, if it did nothing else other than that, would be a phenomenal achievement. But it's doing something else. Because I know from research that I did on wound experiment, wound healing, I'm pretty well steeped in wound healing. When you tug on the skin with a vacuum, you pull on the connective tissue underlying the skin, which irritates the fibroblasts. These are the little cells throughout your connective tissue. And the fibroblasts, in response to this little irritation of being torqued or tweaked, will release growth factors like, I'm sorry if they give you some technical names, but vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, V-E-G-F. And the VEGF will cause the lining of the blood vessels, the endothelial lining, to make nitric oxide. Nitric oxide will dilate the vessels and do a whole lot of other things that are really important for the body. So if you're, the warmth and the nitric oxide are propagating through the body, if you're dilating the vessels, and that's why blood pressure comes down, by the way, because you're decreasing resistance. You know, the, the new life data showing mean arterial pressure decreases with the absent treatment because you're, dil you're dilating the vessels so there's less resistance. So if you're dilating vessels because of the nitric oxide, so there's more blood flowing to the tissues, and then hemoglobin in the blood is delivering up more oxygen, you get a big burst, big load of oxygen being delivered to the tissues. And that's going to heal and cure a lot of medical conditions. 
Bill I'm, and, and Stan, I'm particularly interested in, in Joey. I really want to see how this is going to work in diabetic neuropathy, where the neurons are ischemic. They don't have enough blood. So it's going to be wonderful to see that. And Tom told me that it does work for that. So it's going to be really fun to see. So then, in the, so in that conversation that I was having with some of the heads of New Life Ventures, it lasts about an hour and a half on a Zoom conference like this. And at the end of the hour and a half, Joey says, hey, Richard, I'm experiencing some of the growth factors that you're talking about. I said, what do you mean you're experiencing growth factors? This is what he says he feels really well. So I'm looking at him on the screen, and he's beatific. His face is glowing. Stand kind of like what you were experiencing. And I said to him, you know, maybe it's an endocannabinoid. Maybe you're somehow this is stimulating your body's own cannabinoid neurotransmitters. He said, could be. But you know the look that you feel, the feel that you feel sitting in front of a fireplace with friends and you're sipping on hot chocolate, or maybe some grog, and everything's cozy, what the Germans call Gemütlichkeit, that feeling, that's what was on Joey's face. Right, Joey? So I said, there's something really profound going on here. Because if autistic children are getting better, and migraineurs are getting better, things are being released, neuro growth factors, neurotrophic factors. The Parkinson patients are getting better, neurotrophic factors. So what's being released that could make Joey look so contented and happy and calm? I thought about it. it could be the endocannabinoids, but I really began to think it was oxytocin. Oxytocin is really important. It's the bonding hormone. When the mother delivers a baby, a lot of oxytocin is released. It actually helps the propulsion for delivery. When she's suckling the baby, the mom gets a surge of oxytocin. The baby gets a surge of oxytocin. And it's bonding. When you pet your dog or your cat, you get a surge of oxytocin and your pet gets a surge of oxytocin. It's bonding. So Joey was seeming to exhibit, I hate to sound so clinical, a lot of oxytocin blessed good feelings. But oxytocin is not just a feel-good hormone. It's actually a very powerful analgesic. And there are journal articles you can find online. I'll be glad to send to anyone who wants to see it. From published by pain specialists and pain clinics where they're trying to get their patients off of opiates or at least to avoid opiates in the first place. And they administer oxytocin. And these physicians are reporting that oxytocin is almost as good a pain reliever as the opiates. Isn't that phenomenal? So I looked into oxytocin. Turns out that oxytocin gets secreted, synthesized, and stored in the pituitary. What releases oxytocin when it's stored? Warmth. Avacyn does that. And nitric oxide. Avacyn does that. So all of a sudden, I'm going, whoa, this is a gold mine, copper mine, diamond mine, silver mine. This device has such a plethora, such an embarrassment of riches for the growth factors and hormones that promote healing and well-being. This is wonderful. I'm so excited to be a part of this, uh, this group. And I just want to close my remarks by saying that a friend of mine who was a therapist quotes a Buddhist expression for something like this. The Buddhist would call this a, um, I'm thinking of the term, a righteous livelihood. For human health. Yes. And to That's heal. Carlton, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you.